I guess we need to come back to the wine or drinks. It was just for this exciting round table discussion. Um, so, um, what we've decided this evening is to have this uh, round table discussion, but what I'd like this drink to be as um, interesting, as interactive as possible, even though um, it's been a long day and a hot day. Um, but it, I think it'd be a nice occasion to come back on to few of the topics that have been discussed during the day today um, and maybe now um, that you've had the uh, first day talking about fire refining all day, listening to the issues, um, you might have some new questions um, that will come to mind and hopefully um, the panel will also help you to um, uh, come up with these questions, stimulate some new ideas. Um, for the discussion, so uh, we're a little bit um, short on the panel uh, this evening because um, there's two people who couldn't make it uh, for different reasons and I was originally not supposed to be the, uh, the MC for this evening um, so I inherited this, uh, this role as well but I'll do my best. Um, so uh, the questions that were originally uh, put up for the panel and what we'd like to get the opinions from the panel on um, really to come around a sort of major question which is um, about what could be the factors that are either promoting or holding up uh, advanced fire refining in Europe but also elsewhere in the world um, right now. Now we've seen some quite exciting things today, we've seen the uh, work that's been done in Italy with the uh, opening of the Crescentino plant, so uh, we can't say that nothing's happening, things are happening, but we also are aware that some things are not happening, happening as fast as we would like them. And I think earlier it was said that um, for several years now, um, cellulosic ethanol, for instance, has been announced. I remember in two, uh, the year 2000, I think it was, that Biogen announced um, second generation ethanol in 2001. But that didn't happen uh, for many reasons. So um, that's really the context of what we're going to talk about tonight. And I think the first thing that I'd like to um, ask the different men or the members of the panel is to simply formulate this question. So what is going on in the biorefining field? And what uh, do they think are the factors that are holding up um, biorefining? And uh, without giving too much away, I know we're going to talk about um, a little bit about regulatory issues, which has been a topic that hasn't really uh, been discussed yet during the day. So maybe we can start off. I was told that I should always start with people on my right, so I'm going to start with someone on my left. Um, and maybe ask uh, Eric first uh, if he would like to tell us about his thoughts. What is slowing down holding up the fire refining area? Thank you. Uh, for us as a company, we invest in both the first and uh, the second generation technologies. In fact, rather than give technologies a name, we, just, we like biofuels and fire refining. So, if something makes sense, we'll be very interested in it. The only caveat that we, we aren't interested in investing outside here. And that makes us radically different than most of the people who are committed to advanced biofuels because pretty much all of those people in Europe are investing most of their time and energy outside of Europe as you've heard from several people today. So our only interest is what can we do in Europe. And right now, we don't think the issue has anything at all to do with technology. Uh, bio refining right now uh, isn't being held up by technology uh, either because of uh, uh, advances that need to be made or even more critically from an investor's perspective whether an investor can be sure that something will work like it's supposed to work. Both of those issues are now resolved enough. So right now we believe what's holding us back from making investments is just the regulatory environment isn't just bad, it's toxic for anything to do with the bioeconomy uh, that's related to, to fuel and, and, and energy. Because for those of you who don't know, uh, two years ago, the European Commission proposed completely overhauling the uh, Renewable Energy Directive as it related to biofuels. Um, which is 
troublesome already from an investor, investor perspective, but the reasons given for all of overhaul turned out to be completely specious, lacking any sort of basis in, in actual science. So as we look forward to an advanced buyer refining, uh, the biggest fear that investors have that actually have seen this regulatory environment close up is that it can turn on a dime in very bizarre ways. So for example, uh, I wasn't here all day, but uh, we're, for example, not interested in agricultural residues as a feedstock at all. We don't think it makes any sense at all. It makes sense to people who imagine that there are places in Europe where things just rot on the ground and things cost nothing. But as those of you who go down to our plant tomorrow, we'll see if we pass all the wheat fields, all the wheat and barley and the rye that's being harvested. Immediately, the, the crop residues are bad, so there's nothing wasting on there. It's a, it's a made up uh, source of, of feedstock. There's already a high economic value to all of them here in Hungary that there is in the rest of Europe. So we're interested in, in energy grasses grown on abandoned and degraded plants, which are great because they create jobs. They have much, much higher uh, carbon safe, uh, greenhouse gas safety potential, much extremely. Uh, higher and they completely avoid any food versus fuel concerns, direct or indirect. And we have two projects right now that we would love to pull the trigger on and do, uh, and we can't because there's a large lobby around biofuels in Europe which says that land based biofuels are bad and growing energy grasses is evil, and various iterations of the amendments to the Renewable Energy Directive would preclude energy grasses from uh, any sort of acceptance as, as an advanced biofuel. So we see in that uh, uh, right now uh, an absolute uh, prohibition against any type of real scale investment. Okay, well, you've raised a lot of issues there, some very strong opinions. Um, so as not to like, um, lose everybody along the way, what I suggest is, if it's possible, is anybody around the table capable in two or three sentences, even yourself, Eric, of explaining what the Renewable Energy Directive says and why is it not suitable for you, for instance? The Renewable Energy Directive says that 10% of transport sector energy in 2020 should be provided for renewable sources. So it's not a mandate like there is in, in the US. It just says 10%. But the market and uh, individual member states can influence how that 10% uh, is allocated among various industries. But one thing that it did from the very beginning was it removed fossil fuels from the competitive environment of renewable energy uh, in, uh, in the transport sector. So the biodiesel and ethanol and advanced ethanol and electric cars uh, all found themselves competing against each other for future market share, which has led to a lot of jockeying for position based upon trying to uh, trying to explain why other renewables aren't acceptable or good. So right now it's very unclear whether that 10% will be met and how it can be met since the amendment Proposed amendments now on the table would limit the contribution of crop-based biofuels uh, to no more than 7% of that 10%. Okay, thanks. Do you feel we've got anything to add about the renewable energy directive? You mentioned it in one of your slides earlier. Uh, from my point of view, the, ener the renewable energy directive has a very important annex. Uh, as you know, I'm working for life cycle assessment for my whole career, for more than 20 years, and this is the first time that the LCA methodology appears in a, in a governmental document, really giving binding calculation method, because the biofuels, they have to reach a minimum greenhouse gas saving of 35%, which is on the first glance maybe not so much, so that this will increase in next year to 50%, and for new installations, up to 60%, and they have implemented a system to calculate a life cycle methodology, a little bit simplified, of course, but it's a life cycle thinking behind it, that each liter of biofuel needs a certificate that the greenhouse gas emission saving 
the 30%. And I think the political idea was the 30% to keep that low because most of the biofuel producers now reach the 35%, but that helps to install the system and in future we can make the system more and more tougher. And I think that's the starting point that at least with the biofuels we started, there are also some other sustainability criteria in this renewable energy directive. And it's only binding now for the biofuels that they have to really certify the whole value chain, the whole life cycle on the sustainability. And I hope, personally, I hope it's a starting point that in future all type of biomass used for food, for feed, for power, for heat, for chemicals, for everything, has the same regulation so that they all have to at least show that their production is really sustainable. I really hope that will come into place. With the biofuels we started for certain reasons, it's a good start, and we hope it will come for the others too. Thanks. Do we have any uh, aficionados of... Uh, yeah, make a comment. Yeah, I was going to ask you to make a comment in a second about um, what, um, another aspect. Do you have any, uh, in, are there any aficionados of um, European public policy in the audience at all? No? It's all new for everybody. I guess so. Okay, Daniel, go ahead. No, because I am mean, the one that is saying a strange thing all the day, I, I keep going on. I was at the, at the conference uh, a week ago and I was with some of these uh, uh, member of the uh, of the bureaucracy that is forcing this uh, new industry to make all these sustainability index. Uh, and at that table I was uh, saying the opposite. Why the biofuel have to do all this and the fuel not? So now we have the biofuel that are, uh, have a burden. Of course, is the new industry. There are already a lot of difficulties. It's on top of the technical difficulties and all the difficulties that you have when you start a new um, activity. You add the fact that you need to be certified and uh, you need to, uh, to have a lot of sustainability index. I can tell you that we have a school of people tracing all the straw that is coming in our crescentino plant and trying to go to a farmer and say, yeah, you have to give me straw that have to be certified according to the direct directive. They send, send you to hell. And say, go to hell. Why do you have to certify? So I think that sustainability index is good for biofuels. If there is a sustainability index for all fuels, then we have a, a, a fair ground to play. Okay, I can say that um, the panel wants to be provocative this evening. <laughs> so, just out of interest, um, how many people in this room would be uh, satisfied if we said, okay, since uh, conventional fossil fuels aren't uh, certified or uh, submitted to such regulations, that you'll be happy to give a, uh, a green light to the biofuel industry to make biofuels without any um, certification? So those who are for getting rid of certification on biofuels, put your hand up. Without, without certification. Yeah. Oh, without certification, yeah. So you're happy to have biofuels that you don't really know whether they're sustainable or not. You don't care. They still have to compete with uh, uh, with fuels. The moment that the competition is unfair. Yeah, okay. So, so for you, that's the most important point. There was one other person. Yeah, for, for me, in Canada, they're now trying to to have oil from a house called fractionation oil. Yeah. And they make a lot of side products. It's so economically unfriendly. And so it, it, it's really rubbish. It's so environmentally unfriendly. And that's still allowed. Well, here, we have to do everything you can. And for me personally, it's a personal opinion. I'm more for uh, keeping the market free than over-regulating, because over-regulating always causes more problems. So in that sense, I say, just skip every regulation, because I don't want everything to be regulated. Okay, so there was, there was only two people put their hand up. Are you sure nobody else wants to put their hand up so we can hear what you've got to say? No? So most of you didn't put your hand up. That means most of you would like, nevertheless, for biofuels production to be regulated and certified so that you can be reassured that we're doing something sustainable. Would anybody like to comment on that and say why they think it's important? Yeah, we've got uh, the gentleman at the back. Yeah. 
I think it is important because uh, you try to... I you need the, the microphone. It's coming. <laughs> I think that it is important because you actually want to make a case. You want to make a case that you are different and you are not going to convince that you are different. Remember that a lot of research, subsidies, you know, favor uh, uh, from, from government, you know, uh, or EU uh, is, uh, is behind the biofiners and biorenewables. And you cannot uh, sustain this support, you cannot justify this support if you have not convinced that you make a difference. So that is apparently important for me to have this certification. Again, there is a lot of support, promotion, money funds, you know, that are, are intended, you know, to uh, help us progress you know, towards a solution. And this is linked with all that. Okay. Well, exceptionally, I'll yeah, okay. uh, Can I make one? Two, two times, yeah, go on. <laughs> Okay, for, for me the thing is, is that yes, you get some more uh, subsidies from the European Union, but you scare off all the private investors because, no, that's not the case? We never, we never has another opinion. We, we need much stronger and deeper sustainability requirements, especially if we're going to do things in Europe. So the attacks that are placed upon biofuels, so that I think this is an extension of what you were saying, is there's still, you read out there all the time, worse than fossil fuels, worse than fossil fuels. The EU ethanol industry is 90% of the industry, unfortunately, you guys need to join. But all of the ethanol producers in, in Europe uh, just issued a state of the industry report. We use the RED methodology and our actual, actual data to show that our average greenhouse gas savings last year was 60%. Unless we were able to come up with things like that, then we'll have people very conveniently saying, it's all a scam, they're worse than fossil fuels. Yeah, but that's something completely different. That's something different than regulations with subsidy. That, that, that's saying, yes, we can do it, and you show a report, that's something else, then you have really the regulation in place. You just made a report together with the whole industry, saying like... Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, I mean, you won't do it if there's no regulations. It costs money to do these things. Okay. So, um, so that's first. Uh, I'm going up now. This is starting to the, yeah. the tongs are starting to wag now. Uh, what I think is like uh, we we need to have a, some strong platform. So if we have a strong platform, we are there buddy now. We are just going to start to make something globalized. So we need to have uh, some standards. So and these standards are nothing. It's not uh, laid by any political people. I mean, it's done by the experts and we discuss with the other engineers what is the requirement for each engine and what is the what is the possible we can make it from the our raw material. So we just collaborate with each other and what are the possibilities we can make. So we made this law. So it's not anyone who made this maybe this one. So it would be good that we may can we all need to update it every time so that based on the raw material, based on the climate, based on the condition. So it would be good to follow systematic to make it a globalized one. Because otherwise if we go to small, small shops, small, small markets, then it, no one has a standard one. So all the engine people, all they design the engine because the different people have different standards, different ones. So they can't design the engine. So we should not think more only in the biofuel point of view. We have to think about where it's going to be used. Okay. So I'd like to, can I, yeah. I'd like to move on to another point where I've detected a disagreement and it's another disagreement between our two company representatives. So I think that's quite fun as well. Um, so according to Eric, um, ag residues are just not available. They're not there, they're being used for other things. I mean, you did say in Hungary, but I guess somewhere along the line, your conviction is that it's probably the same everywhere. Earlier today, you said there's three, over 300 million tons of ag residues in Europe available. Um, I don't know whether you were there for my talk this morning, but I said there was about 200 million, so we're, you know, in the same ballpark. But of the 200 million, there's probably only about 50, according to the results that I've seen, that are really available. Um, so um, the question is for um, the panel members, and maybe we'll, we'll let Eric and Gary all speak in a second time around. So we'll start with uh, Richard and Gerfried this time. Um, what do you think about biomass availability? It, are, are the ag residues available? And maybe Richard, you could say something about um, what you see of the dangers of uh, 
anger residues, all the inflammatory side of them. Um, first, two, two laws of, of survival that uh, the source of the bio, biomass is based upon. Number one is the law of survival. And that is that the dog barks and money talks. And the second one is law of farmer sustainability. And that is if farmers don't make money, they don't farm. So farms are the source of the, the biomass. I heard Eric say we have to rely upon basically perennial feedstocks, but dedicated, dedicated feedstocks as opposed to annual biomass, and the biomass of annual crops. Uh, perennial grasses have a physiology that's much different than annual crops that have a big impact on soil sustainability. So what Eric is saying, I think, has, has a lot of value. Um, my two minutes is up, stop me. <laughs> no, stop me for a minute. Uh, everyone understands what uh, crop yield maps are in the field. Anyone does not. Farmers have computers on combines, so they have the capacity so they can identify what the yield is in each given yield cell, maybe uh, five meters by three meters in size, and maybe bigger. By knowing the input cost, you can have a profit map on a given field. My, my field is soil science. But in every field, there are basically areas that are profit losses every year. It's the biofuel industry to help those farmers delineate what to do with those areas because the industry that sells seeds is not going to. They have a vested interest in selling seeds to those areas. There are riparian areas that are environmentally sensitive. There are areas of concentrated water flow that should not be in any crops. There are areas in which would benefit both sustainability, economically, just kind of the ways to get that communication to farmers. They have the data themselves, help them use it. Amen. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, Geoffrey, what do you think biomass availability um, and ag residues specifically? Yeah, I want to say two things. One is um, the more you pay, the more you get. Uh, and, and especially with the biomass potential, we have in Austria the discussion was the pulp and paper industry, which is yet another residue, but the pulp and paper industry, they are used for more than 100 years to get cheap wood from the Austrian foresters. Yeah? And now a new business comes, they also want to have the same wood, and the price increases. And they always claim there is no wood, but there is wood, but there is no cheap wood left. Yeah? So they have to pay more. And of course, this, and they start asking a farmer for the straw, yeah? the price will increase and increase. So that, that also from our potential analysis, we know some cost curves, they go up the more you want, and of course the market price uh, follows the, the cost curves. So in principle, I think that it depends really on the cost, which is at least not very good, because in biorefinery we know the feedstock costs are a dominating factor for bioethanol, for pulp and paper, of course. That's, that's a pity, that has to be, that has to be regarded. The other thing is when, when, when Mike is talking about the residues, Draw as an example. We know that the residue is a residue because it's just a byproduct from something else. Yeah? And people talk about waste cooking oil. Yeah? It's uh, such a good resource to make biodiesel, and it's so nice, but the amount of waste cooking oil is so limited. So you can eat more Wiener Schnitzel and more Hamburger if you have more waste cooking oil, but still you cannot eat so much Wiener Schnitzel. I come from Austria, so we have to eat more Wiener Schnitzel. We have more waste cooking oil. But still, the amount is limited. It's similar to the straw. And you always depend on the farmer to grow some grain or whatever to get the straw. Yeah? So the, the residues, in principle, my feeling at the wastewater and the soup stuff, it comes anyway yeah? in a certain amount. And most of the residues, I think the low hanging fruits of the residues, they are used now, most of them for energy. And still, coming back to the straw, still I think straw is available. In, in a certain amount, I don't know the exact figures, but I think still straw is available in a sustainable way, and this is a quite nice feedstock, not only for bioethanol, but also for other nice things. Okay, so some straw is available. Um, Dario, you seem to think that there was availability, so how is Chemtex um, uh, securing its biomass supply, and, and where does this confidence in the future come from? Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, Biochemtex uh, 
uh, objective is to license the technology. So I'm, I'm aligned on the fact that the, the future is uh, on energy classes to be common marginal lands. That is where the, uh, the, the, the majority of the biomass for the future will, uh, will need to, to be uh, to, to come. So that's, uh, I think, is clear. We have done a lot of work on uh, on our the donors and on switch grass. We, we are developing supply chain for some of our customers in this direction. When I was mentioning to residues, is because uh, uh, if you like to license today plants, the first plant will be based on residues. And so you have to look where you can uh, find areas in which you have residues at a reasonable price. And you will see, and probably there is not a large amount available at a good price, but there is some. And so that one of the things that we are doing, we are trying to find the areas in which there is some. Maybe in Europe is more difficult, but you will uh, see in the next uh, months uh, that uh, a project will be launched in Central Europe, and they have found uh, uh, residues to, to, to sustain an industrial plant. We have launched a large project in China because in the Fujian province we will uh, collect um, almost uh, one million ton of straw and we are supported by the local government because they do not, do not know what to do with the straw and they are burning in the field. Uh, the plant in Brazil is based on uh, uh, sugarcane straw. It is available in large quantity and is not collected. So there are messages in some part of the world that you can use at, economic, uh, uh, at an economic cost. In Europe, uh -huh. then it uh, depends on the area. For instance, uh, because now um, you say the straw being burnt in the field, yeah? Tomorrow you buy the straw, so it's no longer being burnt in the field. So then it becomes an econo economic, it becomes a commodity yeah, with an economic value. So, um, but how long will the price stay stable? I don't and know. Uh, if, I, if I know, I will buy future on the <laughs> so, But that's but the, the same. The same will apply for uh, for energy costs. So this Once is a question for a company that pays two hundred million euros to build a factory. Uh, you need some sort of visibility. So yeah. it's uh, project by project. You need to build your supply chain. For instance, we are securing. Uh, uh, the financing of the Chinese project with a long-term uh, contract. But uh, there are cases in which you cannot uh, uh, organize a long-term contract and at that point you don't build the project, so. Does anybody, uh, uh, because I know that um, some people in the audience have um, very specific um, skills and knowledge. Is anybody knowledgeable about biomass availability? Somebody? Well, um my company is working with a biomass uh, residue that is actually neglected. It's the residue from coffee pot. You can see it in the abstracts, right, in the, in the brochure. And the availability of that biomass is huge. Co coffee, coffee is consumed only by the bean, and 50% of the biomass of the crop is just thrown away. That's just an example. Take palm oil, take cocoa plantations. The huge amount of biomass that is available in the crop basically allows the production of all the bio-based bio products without using uh, more land. Here in Europe, they say, yes, of course, we have uh, the, the technologies here, but there, there is not enough uh, biomass production. It's so much that all the feedstock for uh, feeding cows and pigs come from somewhere else, where is uh, the soil being produced. It's in Argentina, and in Mexico, and in Bolivia. That's where the, the real residues are. So I think that problem is not a problem of availability of biomass, it's a problem of logistics of biomass. Okay, thanks, that's a useful connection. Right, Johan, um, can we have some microphones? Yes, of course. I would uh, make again the, the remark that there is a lot of hidden residues. Uh, I showed you this morning uh, for instance, animal feed streams that we now use in a very inefficient way. Part of the components in animal feed are useful for animals, part are not useful, and parts are even negative useful for animals. In Europe, we have about 400 uh, million tons of compound feed 
that doesn't include grass to animals. So this is just the compound feed, the industrial uh, feed for animals. If, say, 25% of this is not useful, or maybe my estimations are even higher, say 40 or 50% are not useful, then there is a very good combination between the animal feed industry and the bio-based economy, because if you do the bio-refinery, then you can easily 100 million tons available, collected in the factory, or even more. And that's hidden uh, residues. Okay, so the message there is getting more from what we have already before trying to make uh, extra bio-mass. I'd like to come back to one point um, that Eric raised, which was um, the term marginal land. I'd be interested to um, know what you put behind that term and if you can explain it in very brief terms to everybody what marginal land is and why it's interesting to use. Maybe just one clarification. Before that, uh, our, our resistance to agricultural residues is because of their inability to serve the foundation for investments, not for their use as a viable feedstock. So as an investor, you need to know that that feedstock is there at a certain price for the next 10 or 15 years. And that's where the whole agricultural residue argument falls apart specifically for the reasons that you mentioned, because the logistical realities in the tropical areas are that the what's delivered to, what comes off the palm oil plantation and then is pressed for oil, you have these huge uh, deposits uh, centralized deposits of refuse, and the reality of Europe is that nothing is centralized. So that's what makes the, the logistics uh, very challenging. On the other hand, in, in Europe, Europe has had, especially in this part of Europe, policies to discourage the use of land for agriculture or to allow agricultural subsidies for the users of some land and not others. And so for the most part, if you see agricultural land in Europe, especially this part of Europe, that's land to which a subsidy is attached, whether there's any production on the land or not. And the amount of, of actually farmed land in this part of the world declined dramatically uh, as a condition of joining the European Union. And, and actually, this also applies to uh, non-EU members as well, just because in a lot of socialist areas, uh, large land areas fell out of use uh, because of the economic turmoil, turmoil in recent decades. So within this part of the world, especially but throughout Europe and up into Scandinavia, you have large amounts of land which is uh, suitable for agriculture, uh, which is basically abandoned. Now, some of it is, is truly degraded. Uh, uh, it wouldn't be suitable for growing food crops, but for the most part, we're just talking about land that, that isn't used. And were we to focus the bioeconomy on those areas, which already don't receive subsidies, uh, but to produce the biomass that we need, then you are not engaged in, uh, frankly, if you use the absolute correct word, screwing the pulp and paper industry or, or dislocating some other industry that doesn't have subsidies. Uh, we would just be creating new, new biomass new investment, more jobs, more, especially more rural jobs. So uh, it's, a, it's a side benefit also that almost all of this land in this part of the world is very low carbon stock right now. So if you plant any crops on it uh, with high biomass value, so that could be a, an annual crop like, like sorghum or even corn, uh, but if you plant perennial crops which sequester a lot of uh, carbon in the soil, then you would be uh, looking at the climate benefits of that industry, you would be doubling climate benefits almost by definition. And can you put a figure on the marginal land available in Europe? Uh, people, people do, it's, it's millions of hectares. Okay. Any, any comments on marginal land? Gary, no? Any experts? be an expert but <laughs> but you're the best and expert among us here okay and, and everybody's got big problems uh, I think it's, it's quite easy uh, number one land that uh, in terms of marginality for profits are not captured by the farmer consistently areas that are environmentally degraded by the current climate typically by soil erosion 
areas where water quality is threatened, which is either the, uh, you pick your, your size, but uh, 10 to 15 meter riparian areas along perennial streams and areas that supply water to municipalities. Okay, keep your microphone because you, you, you've used a, like a, a buzzword for me, which is water. Now, um, I think uh, somebody somewhere said that um, there'll be three issues that can cause war, and one is food, the other one is energy, and the third one is water. Um, what are the issues, according to you, Richard, um, linked to water and uh, future biofighting? How do you, you know, do you have any words of wisdom on that? Um, I'm going to talk about uh, 10 to 12 minutes on that Wednesday morning. That might be a better use of Wait, time. Wait, you, you can give us just one minute on it right now. Okay. okay. Uh, the answer is, is yes. Uh, agriculture uses about 70% of all fresh water use, accounts for 70% of all fresh water use, and most of that is irrigation. And I'm giving away one of the questions in my uh, presentation, but 18% of the world's ag land is irrigated. 18% is irrigated, but it supplies 40% of the world's food and feed. 18% supplies 40% of the world's food and feed. There are major areas that are being irrigated in which aquifer inflation <coughs> is occurring in ancient aquifers, that means the water is not being replenished. A Great Plains in the US is one example. Uh, those aquifers were filled with glacial melt. Farmers know it. Government knows it, agency know it, yet we continue to deplete that resource. It's a major issue relative to food production, and food production has to be secure if the bioenergy industry is going to be secure. That was 10 minutes more than a minute. A 10 seconds. <laughs> Thanks very much. Any comments on that? No. Any comments from the audience? If not, I want to go on to, I have two other issues that I'd like to raise. So, we started off by saying, uh, or at least Eric started off by saying, um, <coughs> the real issues today are technology issues. Okay, so that's been said. So now we've, we've uh, agreed that there's some non-technological issues around biorefining. What I'd like to do is switch over to the technological issues and um, get some of your views on that area and, and how you see uh, further developments. Now, Minister Omid Dario, you already give us a lot of answers during your talk. I mean, what do you think of the the real key hurdles right now that um, if we can get over those, they're really going to kick in um, strong technology for the future? But if we look at the, at the ethanol, I think uh, now for the investor there is a technology proven or almost to be proven. There is a selection of supply of technologies because uh, there are companies uh, like Casper, like DuPont, DSM, Poet, uh, Abengoa, they are uh, making their own steps towards industrialization. So I have to say and I agree that that is, a, is an achievement, of course, is a uh, uh, in our case, we are, really, we are completing the second, the other is the first. We are the, the first plants. So there is a margin for uh, improvement, both in the, in the overall capex and in the opex that is still important. We are projecting 30, 40% of the capex going down in the next three, four years. And we are working in this direction. We have seen areas of opportunity. So I think for the biofuels, the, the major opportunity is capex reduction, and this is a natural evolution of every, of every technology wants to keep it the second, the third, and the fourth plants. Um, on, uh, on the other thing is that the, I think the major opportunity for the technology development is uh, outside the mainstream of fuels, is uh, all the other technology that will be part of the biorefinery that will allow to better remunerate the biomass. So you can afford better to uh, get biomass. And that is coming only if you add other pieces to use some part of the biomass that today are burned. And so that, I think, is the era that uh, will allow more uh, technology development.
ask a question. Um, earlier you gave us a, a lesson in history which was fascinating and you showed the different steps that led to the modern day uh, petrochemical industry. And we can see that um, there was um, notably some key steps like um, uh, um, cracking and things like this, which actually allowed uh, leaps in the industry. Um, are the technologies that are now developed, so among others, your own uh, Chemtex technology, is this already um, the, for you, the key foundation stone of the future biorefining industry, or uh, is there still room for quite radically alternative technologies? Because once, as we've seen with the oil industry, once the industry is established, you're locked into a scenario, and it's very hard to step out of that scenario and innovate uh, in a parallel fashion, because the industry becomes very um, uh, set in its ways very quickly. That's one of the characteristics of heavy industry, is its uh, conservatism. But uh, I think that, uh, by analogy, I think uh, we need the, a topping column that is separating the stream. And I do think that uh, the biofuel technology today can be considered a little bit the topping column equivalent. So they separate the stream, they get the, the sugars, and they prepare the sugar for uh, fermentation, they get a, a solid that can be used. So I think uh, this is uh, probably the technology that is becoming more uh, uh, important to convert biomass. I do think other attempt to do more uh, uh, gasification of the like are, are failing. So I think this is, uh, uh, is the one that has the more, uh, uh, it seems that the winning uh, and technology. After that you have separated the stream, I do think that there are uh, multiple uh, uh, possibilities to treat the, uh, the, the stream. And there I think uh, the judge is still out because there are a lot of activity. I was speaking also with people here that are thinking uh, different use of lignin and so on. So of course uh, burning is something that we are learning to do, but uh, the next step are still, uh, still pretty open. Do you want to reply to the technology question? Yeah, I, I, I want to mention another technology which you just mentioned, but maybe a little different view. It's the gasification. It's the thermochemical conversion of biomass into, into its original element, which is carbon and hydrogen, maybe oxygen, but it may be carbon and hydrogen. And this is just a different way to really destroy the biomass in its original structures and make small elements out of it. And these, these elements you can start building on all the chemistry you like. And so far, I think they're not really competing technologies. They, they, they aim at, at other things, but that the progress in gasification, I think, is also quite significant. We have in Gothenburg now a natural gas production from wood gasification, which is quite impressive. In Sweden, they gasify uh, black liquor in the bulk and paper industry to produce methanol as, as a chemical and as a fuel that is also working. In Finland, they also have a gasifier. I think they use tall oil. I'm not sure. What I want to say is it's another technology we think is also quite important to really gasify. Maybe it's close to oil refining. I'm not sure to destroy all the structure of the biomass and to start with the basic elements, carbon and hydrogen, to build all the different, you can build fuels, you can build, build, build chemical blocks, so it's a different approach. I think also ending with different products, with different qualities, especially in, 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 in the fuel market in Europe, we have the problem we consume so much diesel and so less gasoline. Now, I'm not sure that that's a natural law that we only use diesel and export everything from uh, gasoline to, to, to the US. It's not a natural law, but currently we're really searching for also for a diesel substitute and the gasification might offer here a very high quality diesel fuel that might also have a window of opportunity in the future, I think. Okay, thanks for that comment and that allows me maybe to uh, try and get the audience involved again. We, we've heard of mainly today about fire refining and we haven't talked that much about other, what we might call, I wouldn't call gasification really a biorefinery option, personally, that's from personal convictions. Um, but we've mainly heard about, let's say, biochemical routes to biorefining. Now, um, Johan Sanders uh, earlier explained a little bit about the 
fact that it's um, intelligent to use the um, natural existing functions in um, biomass. So maybe what I'd like to do is, is Johan, could you make it like a short recap of that idea and compare it with what um, Gerfrich just said about gasification? And then what I'd like to do is make sure that everybody in the audience has understood um, what the debate, this particular point of the debate is about. What it is basically is uh, sort of gasification. Who, who's familiar with gasification? Who's heard of the term gasification? A quarter of the people in the room. So basically, I'll, I'll try and explain in, in layman's term what gas, gasification is. Basically, what you do is you take biomass and you heat it to very high temperatures, um, around 900 degrees centigrade. And at that temperature, your biomass turns into, um, well, first there's a, a de deconstruction of the biomass. And you basically convert your biomass into almost atoms. So you make carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And depending on the type of gasification technology you use and the temperature you use, you might make some methane and CO2, but very small molecules. Okay? And the advantage of gasification is that then you can rebuild um, molecules using these very simple platform uh, compounds. You can then rebuild molecular complexity in any way you like. So it's a little bit like um, taking a Lego house, smashing, smashing it up, getting all of the little bricks, and then rebuilding something else. Johan, can you defend <laughs> the use of sophisticated biomolecules, please? Well, when you start with, with biomass, uh, for instance, wood, as, as Gerfried uh, indicated, um, well, the wood can be used in various ways. You explained that uh, the stem could be used, spindle wood, and the branches for other things, etc. So I think that is a good remark because some of the wood cannot be used easily for material purposes. But material purposes in this world have at least a value of, say, 500 euros per ton of dry weight biomass. If you break down uh, that precious materials to methane, for instance, um, in this world, um, you would compete with methane from areas like the United States, shale gas at the moment, with areas from the Middle East, where you have methane, well, not at low cost, sometimes even at negative cost because you are not a, allowed to put it in the air. It is produced when oil is, um, is harvested. You have to flare it, it costs a little bit and there's no use. Or you can make, well, very expensive uh, fuels from it, like Shell is doing with enormous big, big factories. That's a good use to do, that technology. I think I admire that technology, because otherwise, well, you have a problem. But methane can be, obtained, say, at a biomass value, say, 50 euros per ton, 10 times lower than if you would use uh, the material as, um, um, as, uh, as material. You talked about uh, coal oil, which is a side product of the paper industry. Well, that coal oil is used for many years by chemical industries as a material to make all kinds of high-value materials not 500 euros, 1,000 euros, 2,000 euros. And now because of unlevel playing field in Scandinavia, and because they, uh, they subsidize biodiesel or energy firms, well then that coal oil is thrown away from that industry and they cannot afford to pay the higher price. Same story as you said about the wood in, in Austria. So um, although it is not a law, the apps that I showed you, uh, but structure in general, from fibers, or molecular structure, uh, more often has a higher value, sometimes even a lot higher value, if you use it in the right way. To break down those molecules is also not for free. You have to have uh, processes that are um, capital intensive, because it is not like Lego that my child or my grandchild at the time can throw away and fiddle around and you have the same uh, thing again. Now you need a big factory 
uh, where a lot of heat is still transferred, which needs a lot of capital costs. And moreover, uh, that needs to change uh, well, are, are very costly. So, uh, well, I would not be really advocating. No. <laughs> Because I recalled your slide this morning that you were saying you need to go with product with high value and low capex, right? Because of the, and that's a, the gasification is going there really in the opposite because you yeah. make small molecules and usually the capex is very intense. So I'm and good remark. I, I give you two answers. One is about the tall oil. That's true. But the interesting thing is the Austrian pulp and paper industry, which exists for more than 100 years, never used the tall oil until a few years ago. And now they've seen there's a demand for tall oil. And now they separate it out because maybe the tall oil in Sweden is used for something else. So you see that also creates an incentive. And the Austrian pulp and paper industry, I think, on three locations, they start to, to sort out more or less the, the tall oil. The other thing is, if you remember the tree I've shown you this morning, you have the different parts. And the gasification is maybe more flexible on the quality of the input. Yeah? Because with the high temperature, you can gasify very cheap, very nasty stuff. Yeah? For the biochemical one, yeah, it, it's good to have a little bit better material. So I think they are not directly competing. Yeah, that, that, so that, I think that there is still room for, for both routes. That, that is my key message. And if you look on the tree, with the bark, yeah, you can gasify the bark a little bit to make ethanol out of the bark. It's very difficult. If you have wood chips containing bark, it's even difficult to make something nice out of it. So the bark is already something you can do something else. So at least my message is there's space enough and hopefully enough raw material to provide all these different technologies, it may be the biochemical and the thermal chemical route from lignocellulosic, but it's a big challenge in the future. <coughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
And for better or for worse, most of the biorefining technologies are broadly similar. Yep, we can take yes. a comment. Um, I what, use the microphone. Yes. So, but I do have a comment on that. I think the biorefineries do not have to compete each other because, for example, what you see with algae, algae was trying to compete in the in the sense of producing um, bioethanol or biodiesel, and then they decided, hey, what if we produce food ingredients and then residues we transform it into uh, biofuels. The thing is that biorefinery is not only biofuels. You can get more, let's say, higher end value products, and then biofuels being your bulk product that is not making your full biorefinery, but is part of your, uh, yeah, of your income. So I think uh, biorefineries don't have to compete with each other if the feedstocks are different and the main products that have high value. Okay, are there any more comments on that particular subject area? Yeah, there's one at the back. And two at the back. So, yeah. Sorry, let me just start because uh, we, we did. Um, uh, thanks. I, I have to say that uh, we did an example uh, from UTV trying to get to farmers here in Hungary. And um, to those farmers, we actually got their own feedstock with their own biogas plant. And we try to pursue them to forget their uh, cogeneration engines and let's upgrade their gas so they can use it in their um, own vehicles. And um, I have to say that no one was interested in it, despite having something more valuable than electricity and heat. And uh, the reason is because they don't want to invest. You know, for, 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 for them, the, the feedstock is a waste that they have to treat it anyway. So if somebody tomorrow gives them, uh, let's say, a euro more per ton for the, for the feedstock, somebody else is going to take it. And it's going to disappear. So you can't, I mean, this is our opinion, you can't base technology on the feedstock. Well, I mean, it might be there, you know, today, it might be there tomorrow, but what happens day after tomorrow if somebody else comes and says, offers you a euro more for that because you don't own the feedstock. That's why I think that's the biggest risk for any uh, biorefinery technology. That feedstock, it may be there today, but for a technology like this, which has got uh, high um, uh, care packs, you, you, know, you need time to, to break even. You haven't made a profit yet. And before you get to make a profit, your feedstock just disappears. I mean, at this part of the world, at least. <laughs> Thank you. And there was another comment, Anthony. Yes. Uh, I think the argument uh, between uh, about uh, thermal methods and uh, biochemical methods uh, underlines uh, an important difference between oil and gas platform and the uh, biofine concept. Uh, whereas in oil and gas, you have a global platform, remains the same more or less as you go from place to place. You have your distillation unit, your FCC unit, your annotating unit, more or less the same kind of you know complex, you know, uh, different places. In the biorefinery concept, you you will expect you will have to uh, post uh, different types of technologies as your biomass uh, changes and the proximity to biomass changes as the capacity changes. Uh, as the capacity increases, then the thermal methods will have you know an upper hand. Uh, all these kind of technologies will become more attractive. As you go with smaller sizes, you would expect, you know, the biochemical methods would have an upper hand. So I think this is an important difference between the biorefinery concept and the oil and gas concept. We have noted many similarities between these two, but there are also differences, and I believe that this is one of the differences. Okay, thanks for that comment. I have one last point that I would like to ask the panel to comment on. And that's a little bit related to what's just been said. Um, the oil industry is a global industry um, which has a global business model. Um, given the fundamental differences but also the similarities between 
um, biorefinery industry in the markets, uh, such as fuel markets, that the biorefinery will be targeting. Um, does it have, what are your opinions on the business model? Will we end up with a very similar uh, global bio fuel biorefinery market, um, rather like the oil refinery oil uh, fuel oil market? Or will there be some new business models to develop? Do you have opinions on that? Uh, how will the the biorefinery business organise itself at the world level? Will it be different from continent to continent, or will it be a uniform type of business? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with your comments about oil refineries. I think probably ethanol plants today are more homogenous asset class than refineries. I could go to any ethanol plant in the world and find my way around, no problem. I'm not sure the same can be said about oil refinery or oil refinery. And, and there is a global trade in first generation ethanol. And I don't think, as, as much as all of us here would love for there to just be regional markets because it would help expand the business, I don't think anyone believes that's the case. It will be, it, it already is a global market. I mean, they can they can export to the U.S. right now if, if the uh, if, if the market uh, allows that. The, the, the logistics networks, the traders, the standard the standardization. It's already a, it's already a global market. Uh, Jeff, you're just a clarification. I don't want to follow up. But my question has not, my point was not about having global businesses, but business models. So you, whether you have a uniform type of technology uh, to process your biomass, whether you process biomass in a biochemical you know, way, uh, in Hungary, in, 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 you know, in Africa, in other places of the world, you don't actually have. You produce you know, biodiesel you know, in Germany, you produce bioethanol in Brazil. So you already have different business models. And when you process waste, you don't expect, as you know, was a comment before, that you will produce ethanol or high quality chemicals. It will be other things that you will be producing. So it, it, it all indicates that you will have a proliferation of technologies to process biomass. Some of these technologies, or some parts of these technologies, will merge. You know, will produce, let's say, methane, or will produce syngas, or something else, or ethanol. Yeah, but uh, we're not talking about the business, you know, uh, whether it is, you know, exporting, you know, material or not, but whether it uses the same technology at different places in the world, which is the case for oil and gas. This is, you know, the business platform for oil and gas. More or less, the plan looks very similar <laughs> from one country to another. Uh, I want to come back to the question on, on, on the global market or a global business model. I think if you run a biorefinery, you have to deal with two markets. On one hand, the, the raw material or feedstock market, yeah? and at least all of the feedstocks, even the, the raw, the, the straw or whatever, they will become a commodity, so there will be a market price going up and down. And on the other hand, you, you have the markets to sell your product, yeah? low value on big market or high value on small market. Yeah. So I think the competition on biorefineries will not be on the huge market because the market for, for energy is so big, price is low. The more you go into specialities where you get $2,000 per ton, the market is very small. So you might compete compete on that level. If you look on Borrega, they have very specific things. They can sell for a high price, but we don't need more of these materials. So that, but at least as a biorefinery operator, you, you, you work between these two markets, so I think it will be a global business. And if you look on the current market on, on biomass, if we use more pellets in Europe, they ship it over from Canada, the big ships coming over from Canada because we want to have wood pellets. Nobody's making an LCA calculation. The price is okay. The LCA is also not so bad, so it comes over the ocean. We take the palm oil from the other side of the world, we import the bioethanol. So at least I think it's really a trade. We import biodiesel to Germany if the diesel price is higher in Germany. And we keep it in Austria if the price is higher in Austria. So that's part of the business, if you like it or not, more or less. So I think it will be a real global model where you deal with these two markets, with these two commodities. 
And the price, I think the price will always go up and down and you have to be flexible. And the more flexible you are on the feedstock side, you have four different feedstocks, that's fine. Yeah? And the sugar beet industry, on the other hand, if you, if you have sugar beet, the sugar production in Europe, they need the sugar beets all around all around the, the plant because it's 90% water, you cannot transport it to the other end of the world. So I think there will be niche market for very specific things like sugar beet in, in Europe, where you have very small local business models and others they will be very much globalized and everything in between. Well, okay, Chris, thanks very much. Um, I think it's more or less time to wrap up now. But before we do that, um, beyond the questions or maybe within the framework of the questions that have already been discussed, but in a more sort of free fashion. Does anybody, after listening to all of the um, uh, talks that have been given today and also the discussion this evening, do you have any questions about um, biorefining that you would like to ask right now in a general sort of way um, to anybody you would like and not just the panel, but you're welcome to ask your questions also to the panel. Does anyone have any outstanding questions? One over there. So my question is, I hear a lot about technology and I hear a lot about the availability of uh, biomass. However, I hear nothing about how can you make biomass more available. For instance, when you look in reports uh, about the United States in the last century, the yield on corn has more than doubled. However, the crop size has, uh, I think, decreased by almost 30%. And now, that was in that time, it was because they thought it's only waste and it's easier to harvest. Now we see that it's becoming a commodity again. So is there any research done on that case by instance uh, planting uh, crops that uh, grow taller or something like that? And are the business uh, people also looking at that? I would start by Richard. Hmm. Uh, relative to corn, it's not growing taller, it's actually growing shorter, but we've gone from populations of about 20,000 plants, and I'm going to use per acre because that's what I understand more than hectare. Uh, no, I, I can, I, 42,000 plants per hectare to over 80,000 plants per hectare. We have an industry now that is pushing biomass harvest simply because there is so much residue on the surface, as they're saying, that particularly if you want to plant without tillage, you're better off if you remove some of that residue and get it out of the way. So yes, there is an industry model that is, is making that, uh, that noise. Does anybody else want to comment on that question? Or you, you have, you have wheat prices right, wheat straw prices right now in the north is about 130 euros a ton, and you have wheat sale prices for new harvest at 160 euros a ton, and then you have a consensus in Europe that you shouldn't use food for fuel, and there's a logical outcome of this that relates to the, the bioeconomy, which is that if, if straw is just okay and no questions are asked then we certainly know what wheat plants can grow taller and so produce more biomass per, per hectare. It's just in the past you have wanted to concentrate the metabolic energy of the plant on um, the wheat instead of on the plant. But it would be the easiest thing in the world if the economics make sense to plant wheat crops that are two or three meters high. So, and then as a consequence, of course, you would get less actual wheat, less feed wheat or less milling wheat out of, out of a hectare plant. But that's, again, just why the regulatory environment, especially in Europe, is actually the most important driver of actual practices. Okay, any more questions? Just one no, quick comment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. One quick comment. I know that the University of Copenhagen uh, did a study where they pulled out some um, old leaf variety, uh, varieties of wheat from back in the 40s and 50s see how much more of a, of a biomass yield they could give. And they also looked into how easy they were to digest the digestibility of the wheat straw and found very big differences between the varieties. So at least I know that some people would be into it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the partitioning of the dry matter is a critical point relative to wheat and other small grains that are annually harvested. Uh, what's happening is they've taken and partitioned less dry mass in the root systems 
and more into the seed. So that's the economic part. Now the sustainability implication is that 80% of the organic matter that you see in soils and organic matter is critical comes from the root biomass. So in, in changing the partitioning from the root into the seed, particularly if we're going to harvest the top part, is a negative relative to soil sustainability. Okay, any more questions that somebody would like to ask at this stage? Or has everybody had enough? No, there's some questions, so this is looking good. Uh, there's a question for Mr. Sievers. Um, you said before that the sustainability requirement should be strengthened, and not uh, weakened. What do you mean by that? In Europe, I mean, in, in this regulation. Uh, well, obviously our industry's problems aren't because we're efficient, we're extremely efficient. It's not because we're not becoming more efficient, we become more efficient every year. We don't have any problems with the farmers. The farmers love us. We don't have any problems in our local communities for those who go down to our plant tomorrow. It's, uh, it, it's a benign plant. I mean, in the U.S., I've seen in recent years, people building new houses within 20 meters of, of, of ethanol plants. Uh, it's a great industry on a lot of levels, but it's just perversely attracted incredible amounts of bizarre criticism for things that are out of the control of ethanol plants or that are just actual arguments about modern society in general. The only way we have to fight back against that is by having more sustainability issues. If people are concerned about indirect land use changes, then fine, tell our industry that we can only use feedstock which is grown on abandoned lands or that comes as a result of increases in crop yields. Crop yield in, in Hungary for corn is six euros, uh, six tons per hectare. In Austria, it's 11. And the difference for that is because Austrian land is much better, it's actually much worse. It's because the farmers here don't have a reason to invest in their land, and they'd be happy to invest in land if there were a, a, an obvious market for it. So on most metrics, these sustainability criteria, which at first glance are just annoying, and why is our industry being subject to these? Uh, if the real trade-off for the bio-based economy is that we will give society the product that it wants, not at that high a price, as long as there's some basic assurances on price and on markets, then that's a great trade-off for us. Because we, again, if you want to create a society in which you get the cheapest possible plastics and fuel, it's not going to be based on anything other than fossil fuels. Okay, there was another question along there, and then there'll be a question. So I want to ask the industry people, so I don't know whether I can answer this question or not. So what is your future aim of your future aim? Like you want to plant any other biothanol plant in any other countries, other than Italian, you plant it now. So on what is the payment period of your current company? So. Okay, as I said before, the, the whole of our company has been the one of the developing and demonstrating technology and we are uh, licensing the technology. So we are following every project that there is out there, but we are not going to be the investor. We are not an ethanol producer. We have happened to produce ethanol in the first demonstration plan. But it's not strategy of the company to become an ethanol producer. Uh, so the that's the, the first answer. The second answer on the return on investment is very difficult because it depends on uh, how much you're going to pay the biomass, how big is your plant. Uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, condition. We are running a lot of feasibility uh, uh, study. We, between uh, the end of the year and, uh, and June, we run more than 60 feasibility studies for customers. And of course, the results have been uh, uh, from uh, 13 to 20% internal rate of return depends on, on the conditions, so it's very, very difficult to say the number. Any um, the bioeconomy depending on crops and crops with the current production methods depend on petrol, so uh, to supply the fertilizers. How do you see the role of organic farming uh, in this uh, petrochemical-based circle? Well, I'm 
I would start by something I mentioned this morning, uh, that um, in the current state of organic farming technology, you can expect yield drops, um, something like 20% generally. Um, I have read a paper just a couple of days ago um, where several farming methods and scenarios were compared. And actually, um, what came out, I, I, I can find a reference for you if, if you need, need it, but what came out of the um, analysis was that, um, in fact, it wasn't the organic farm uh, in the different scenarios that were studied that had the lowest carbon footprint, surprisingly. It was um, um, a sort of a halfway house type farming, um, uh, sort of, um, uh, let's say, low input farming, but not organic farming, combined with things like um, pyrolysis technology um, on farm, uh, pyrolysis technology to use the residues, uh, and therefore they, in life cycle analysis, they have a much lower uh, carbon footprint than pure organic farming. So really, I think it all depends on, on what type of um, scenarios that you're actually developing these. It's one of these things like um, uh, Gertrude said earlier that shipping um, wood from Canada to Europe surprisingly doesn't have such a bad uh, LCA um, result. And so things aren't always as obvious as you think they might be. And organic farming might not be the uh, like ultimate solution for um, best farming practices. Um, I think that that's a very relevant and interesting question, the organic farming versus conventional one. And what we know from LCA is, of course, that one is the fossil fuel you need for the tractor. You can substitute that by fissure crop liquid from gasification, for example, because bioethanol is not working on the tractor so far. However, the other thing is that the main contribution of greenhouse gases comes from the NGO emission in agriculture. So that is a significant share on the cultivation, and even on our organic farming, you have to supply nitrogen to the field. And even if you take it from compost or from manure, you still have the NGO emissions. Yeah? And the bad thing, as Michael mentioned, is you have lower yields. Yeah? So the, the thing is, the NGO emissions you have anyway, you can do different practices to lower the NGO emissions. There's not research going on, difficult to implement in the daily farm life, but you can really work on, on that. So and there's no significant difference between organic farming and conventional farming. And the lower yields, that's a problem, that you have at least similar emissions, but the lower yield, and at least you have specifically higher emissions. But still, I think we cannot go towards more and more intensive farming, I think we have to find a more or less good equilibrium between different things and, and that's I think the most important thing. Just to extend that, it's, it's, it's a fundamental difference between farming in this part of the world and in the U.S. and, and maize fields. So the U.S. is actually, just because of the technology, been able to reduce the amount of fertilizer used per plant uh, by, by targeting the fertilizers whereas you unfortunately don't really see that here. And also how the fertilizer is produced is important. We calculate our, our climate benefits every year. We recently had a fertilizer company come to us and explain, look, this is, this is the footprint of our fertilizers, and here's the footprint of these gray market Ukrainian fertilizers that are, that are coming in to Hungary. And if we can work together so that you can convince the farmers that you work with to use the good stuff instead of the bad stuff, and then we calculated the savings are astronomical, they're more than, than, the, than the greenhouse gas savings using the LCA methodology, because of course, as you mentioned, what we do here really all comes down to, to the nitrogen emissions, not to, not to fossil fuels. <coughs> more questions? Where the GMOs stand uh, here, because compared to the organic farming and traditional farming. Here. Well, in, 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 in Europe and in the US, it's different. Okay, let's wake everybody up then. Um, who would be favourable for um, the use of GMOs for non-food purposes, such as biofuels? Okay. 
in the audience? Who would be thankful? Well, not many people. Not many people. That's even less than a quarter of the people put their hand up. Depends which land you use them. Now uh, that's starting to complicate the question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the reason why I asked is um, that, I guess, part of the answer to, to your question. I mean, there's a lot of um, opposition in Europe um, to GMO crops. What would be interesting, I guess, is maybe um, for the members of the panel, especially the two members who are trying to make money out of biomass right now, if I could offer you, I was a seed producer and I could sell you GMO crops tomorrow for your factory, would you buy them? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we produce. This is a private. <laughs> so, so <laughs> no, no, no we, we're, 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 at the end of the day, we're agnostic about this issue. Completely agnostic. Um, but where we stand now, we produce what we believe is the highest quality animal feed in the world. We don't care about it. We actually don't care about it. We love our animal feed, and our customers love it. It's antibiotic-free, uh, and it is GMO-free. Uh, and it's just, it looks great, it tastes great. I mean, everything is great. That's what we care about. Our customers give us a premium because it's GMO-free. And so we we won't take a single truck in that may have GMO uh, grain. We just won't do it. Um, but that's just because we have a relationship with our customers that says that. For, for advanced uh, biofuels, and, and there's also another reason, which is we don't think the GMO crops increase yields. We think that they offer tremendous downside protection in terms of drought resistance, which is also important in this part of the world because the crops here are for the most part non-irrigated. But in a good year, there's no, there's no tremendous bump. As I mentioned before, the Austrian Maize yields are 11 tons per hectare, and that's higher than the US average of 10.6 tons per hectare. And that's all GMO-free maize. Uh, the hybrid seeds that have come along in the past 10 years are, are better. What about the fertilizers? Because now the GMOs are Philosophically, philosophically, um, I mean, not, no, 
Scientifically, I'm agnostic. I like that term. Philosophically, I'm against them for this reason. If you use a chemical and you decide it's wrong, it's negative, we can stop its use. Once you release something that can reproduce, even if we make a, a significant mistake, and humans have been known to make major mistakes, introducing biological species in areas where they thought they would be a good thing, once they escape, you can't control them. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> you're right. Well, you are right. If you make a mistake and you cannot control it, perfectly right. But that doesn't hold for GMO in most of the plants, in seed plants. If you have grass, well, don't use GMO because the seeds, they go over the whole world and you cannot control them. But most of our agricultural crops, you can control them very, very well. And you shouldn't say it in such a black and white uh, way. This is a big debate. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why I, that's, that, that's why I say there's a lot of passion, it's not just politics. Are there any other questions? Not about GMOs. <laughs> no? Have we run out of questions? Run out of energy? Okay, well, I think we did pretty well. It's um, nearly 8 o'clock, it's time for an interactive dinner. Um, I don't know where the dinner is, whether it's down in the restaurant or whether we get to eat outside. We don't get to eat outside. We can? Yeah. Yeah, we can eat outside. Okay. So, um, thanks very much for all of the questions. It was a really interesting evening.